So let me in, uh, introduce you now. So this is uh, something that we call impulse. Um, so let me just, uh, I guess might as well just write it down. Um, definition of something that we call impulse. It's just a word you have to know. Um, I don't know if uh, I try to give some intuitive meaning for this impulse. It's just going to be something we define. <laughs> Let me just write it down. I think your textbook uses the letter J. I never got used to, to it. Um, so I'll just to say spell out impulse. I'm not going to try to use a letter. But I think your textbook uses the letter J. But whatever. Uh, impulse is defined as this. It's a force times duration of time. You have seen a similar definition before. So I want you to compare this definition of impulse to the work that we defined before. So we defined the work this way. Work was defined as force times displacement. So impulse is different in an obvious way that you know here I had the time, I'm sorry, position, change in position. Here, now I, I have change in time. So that's a rather obvious difference. There's one other subtle difference about impulse as compared to work. Any guesses? A vector. It's a vector quantity, yeah. So with the work, it was a product of two vectors. And we defined the product in such a way that it gave us a scalar. This is the dot product. Time, does time have direction? No, you could have positive and negative interval, but that's just, uh, you know, future, but time doesn't have direction. If you can say something is upward or downward or left or rightward, it doesn't have direction. So time doesn't have direction, meaning this is a scalar. So vector times scalar, that's just going to give you a vector 10 out of 10. So impulse is a vector. It's a vector quantity. So um, this is the quantity that we are going to define. And um, here's the thing that's uh, useful to know about impulse. It's, uh, once again, I want to keep comparing it to work because the role of, imp this is like the SAT type analogy. Impulse is to momentum uh, the same way work is to energy. So let me finish this out. Impulse, uh, this is how we define impulse, but this um, how we define impulse, we will see soon that it happens to give us change of momentum. And we'll go through the quick algebra to show that uh, impulse gives change in momentum of an object. And just to complete this comparison here, work, um, as I keep bringing up every single day I mention it, work is important to us because it gives us change of energy. So if we are interested in how impulse of an object might be changing, then we would look at, or sorry, um, if you are, <laughs> misspoke. If you are interested in how momentum of an object might be changing, might be changing, then we would look to impulse. Well, how much impulse was on that object? Let me give you an example here. Um, so I have a golf ball and, uh, and when I drop the golf ball, this golf ball is going to have some amount of momentum just moments before it hits the table, right? So I drop it, and the moment before it hits the table, it's going to be moving at some velocity downward, so it's going to have some downward momentum. Does the momentum of this golf ball change um, when it, as it stri strikes the table, right? So moment before hitting the table, it was moving downward. Moment after hitting the table, it's moving upward. So the momentum of this golf ball is changing um, as it's undergoing collision with the table. Like if you could do a, a you know, high speed camera, you would see the ball kind of uh, you know, strike the table and there's some deformation and you would see it bounce back. Right? So, so I could, in this example, I can ask this question um, with a 
golf ball example uh, where I have a ball that's uh, you know moving downward at some um, at some velocity before it strikes the table and after it strikes the table it uh, let me call it V before and after it strikes the table it moves up uh, with some velocity I'm going to call V after um, I could ask um, what is the change of momentum of the ball and that change of momentum, um, if you look at uh, what I have written in this line, then it's going to relate to the impulse. Now, looking, um, looking at the situation here, would it be easy for you to calculate impulse using the information given here? Like if I asked you to do that, you know, find the force on the ball, find the duration of collision, and then find the change of momentum of the ball. Would you be able to do that? What do you think the force between the table and the ball was during the collision? You don't have any piece of information there, right? And the, what about the duration of time? What do you think the duration of time was for the collision? I guess it's less than a second. How much less than a second? 0 0.3, 0 0.3 seconds is actually surprisingly long. Uh, 0.3 seconds is a third of the time it takes for me to say 1,001. It's like it's saying 1,000 in 0.3 seconds. Do you think in the time where it's colliding, I have time to say 1,000? So Could be less than 0.1 even. Because it's a however long of a time it is for it to produce that thunk sound. So here's the situation where if you're trying to calculate change in momentum this way, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to calculate it. Um, but so um, I probably did this in wrong order. <laughs> um, but that's not to say that this is useless, because there are situations where this is useful. Like if I want to figure out how much momentum of this cart has changed, then you know somebody could be applying a force in a way that you can actually measure the force and they can be applying it for a fixed amount of time. So that after the fixed amount of time, you can actually calculate you know, how much impulse there was and use that to calculate the change in momentum. So what I want to get you to use to is how to calculate this change of momentum in two different ways. One would be through this impulse, which sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. In this situation, how, what would it be easier way of calculating the change of momentum of the ball. Not a trick question, it's got a really simple answer. Like, you know, if, uh, if I just told you the definition of momentum and I asked you, okay, ball is bouncing like this, what is the change in momentum of the ball, what would you tell me? Yeah, that's how you define any kind of difference, right? So you could say this is well, momentum after minus momentum before. Well, I see this here, so I just plug in whatever numbers I have. So say this is a mass can factor dot mass times velocity after minus velocity before. And if you have really good physical intuition, you might go this far. You might have some sense that the speed of the ball is same before and after, right? So if you have that, you might go this far. So you know, if I call the magnitude of this V0, then you know, magnitude of this would be also V0. And you would say, um, so it's, uh, plus V0 minus minus V0, so the total magnitude of change of momentum will be um, 2 m V0 and upward for the vector uh, quantity. 
right? Yes? Good? So, so yeah, this is another way you can calculate change of momentum. And this is actually why it's useful for you to know this definition of impulse. Um, suppose I asked you, um, if the, that this collision takes 0 0.05 seconds, and now I ask you how much force is on the ball during the collision, do you have enough information to answer that? Yeah, you would tie it back to, you should tie, it, tie this change of momentum that we calculated using definition of momentum rather than this impulse thing, but you can tie it back to how impulse is defined. Say that this is equal to impulse as defined here, which means the, as soon as you know the duration of the interaction, then you can figure out, well, I guess I should call this average force. This is the average force during the collision. So these are the two new important qual quantities that we are defining new today. And um, um, I will describe now how this definition of impulse and momentum tells you that total momentum is conserved in many cases. Yeah. So um, let's uh, first, uh, uh, let me show you this portion that uh, mo impulse defined this way does really actually describe change of momentum. Because you know, I just gave this to you without justifying it. Let me justify that. So, so let's put it this way. Um, I have some object here of mass m. And let's say somebody says that I'm applying some force applied and um, uh, apply a force for duration delta t. And the question would be, all right, um, what is what is change of momentum due to the force? So I can approach, it, approach this in a just a standard, straightforward way. I want change of momentum. That means I want change of this quantity. So I'm looking at, I'm looking for what is the uh, final momentum minus the initial momentum before I started pushing it. This could easily be zero, but I just want to keep it general. Um, all right, so this would be equal to, uh, just uh, using the definition that's written there, I'm just gonna write it out. Um, mass times V final minus mass times V initial. Factor out mass. So mass times V final minus V initial. Hmm. Seems like I'm stuck for right now. Because the information I'm given is, has nothing to do with the velocity. The information I'm given has something to do with apply the force and the duration of application of force. So, you know, thinking back to what you know about forces and what you know about kinematics, how would you connect from here to this information that's given? Yes? Yeah, so you can relate change in velocity with acceleration. Let me write down the formula that you should remember. So acceleration is defined as rate of change of velocity, or I could write this out as final velocity minus initial velocity over duration of time. All right, that's gotta be useful somehow here. So, um, so let me actually plug this in here. So it, then it's going to be, um, so mass is still the same mass, mass times. Um, so imagine solving this for this, then it's acceleration times delta t. 
So acceleration of the block times delta t, the duration of its acceleration. Yeah. Staring at this for a while, I, you, I realize that I can regroup this. I can group this this way instead. Right? OK. So um, then, OK, mass times acceleration. Well, here, the only force that's uh, being applied is the applied force. There's no other horizontal force in effect. So this force is mass times acceleration. So I can say this is equal to applied force times the duration of application of that force. And well, that's equal to impulse, the way we defined it. So that's why this change of momentum is equal to impulse. Okay. Questions, comments? Um, I guess this is actually a good time for me to introduce this idea. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Different semesters, I do it at different times. But I think the earlier I can do it, the better it is. So let me do it now. Um, when you look at this expression for too long, or maybe about the right length of time, you might, uh, I hope you wonder whether this is true. If you can write out force this way, if you can say, um, apply the force. can be measured instead of saying force is mass times acceleration, if you could say force is, well, impulse or change of momentum. So apply the force is change of momentum divided by time. Does this sound plausible? Yeah? That applied force can be expressed this way instead of the way we are used to saying it that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Like this sounds plausible, right? And in fact, if you are following this chain of equalities, um, you might say, all right, so that's two different ways of expressing the same idea about force. And what I want to tell you is that, so, so far you haven't had a situation where you would have to pick and choose between these two. Um, they, they are both true, they agree with each other. That's what you see here. And um, what I would tell you is that there will be situations in the future where um, they actually disagree with each other. The most common example that's cited, so I'll give that example to you. The most common example that can be given is this one. So um, it, it's a, you know, space, I guess, aerospace application uh, rocket. So imagine you have a, a rocket in space or some air mid flight and um, so, uh, Everyone here knows how a rocket works? Does everyone here know how a rocket works in vacuum of space where it doesn't have anything to push against? There's a very amusing New York Times uh, editorial back in the 1920s saying how the rocket couldn't work in the vacuum, but it turns out, as you see in Apollo programs in the 60s, that rockets do work in space. Um, so they published a retraction in 1969 you guys never heard of this? Never mind. Um, but you know, rockets do work in the vacuum of space. So, um, so you know, if this is, so you know, in terms of um, how you get yourself to move, the way you normally move is you move by reaction force. As in, when I walk, I'm, um, so you know, when I walk, so the way I walk, is using my foot, I apply a force to the ground, I push the ground back. And because of friction, because I'm wearing good shoes, ground pushes me forward. That's how I move forward when I walk. Or if you are swimming and you are not a good swimmer, then one way you can move fast is you just push against the wall. 
you apply normal force to the wall, wall pushes you back, so you move forward. So the rocket propulsion, it's going to be the similar idea. The rocket pushes something backward, and that something pushes the rocket forward. Why do you think that something that's getting pushed backward is? Sorry, what? You, did you say fire? So there's a combustion going on in here, but fire is an idea, not an object. You have to push an object backward. Right, Tana? Something that's a part of the rocket, yeah. So uh, in the rocket propulsion, so rocket actually carries its own fuel. In the vacuum of space, there's no oxygen to cause combustion with, so rocket has to carry oxygen and everything with it. And so there's combustion here, and the pressure pushes out um, the particles that it was carrying as part of its fuel. So the way this rocket is um, propelling itself is essentially imagine some part of the rocket, the fuel, that's getting pushed outward. And as a result of the push, the rocket is getting, um, so let me call this the action force. And as a result of push, the rocket gets, rocket gets the reaction force from the, its fuel, and that's how it's moving up. So looking at this situation, somebody could ask you, what is the force on the rocket? And if you naively calculate force this way, as in, you know, let's say you are given the trajectory of the rocket, so you know it's a position as a function of time, which means you know it's a velocity and acceleration as a function of time, right? And somebody asks you, what is the force on rocket? And if you answer this question with saying, um, with the answer that force is equal to mass times acceleration, um, you'll be wrong. Force on rocket in this case actually will not be equal to mass times acceleration. In fact, um, so we have two different expressions for force, right? Uh, so far, this and this. And this is the situation where these two expressions will disagree with each other. So you have a choice of, uh, well, what is going to be the force on this rocket? So you could have said, well, maybe it's the formula that I already know. Maybe it's a mass times acceleration. Or maybe it's given by this new expression, change of the momentum of the rocket divided by change of time. Like why? Uh, so we saw before here that these two expressions agreed with each other. So in this specific, in this special situation, why would these two expressions now not agree with each other? Like why wouldn't it be that they are both correct or they are both wrong, if that could have happened? Like what, um, which part of the description of the rocket here makes you reconsider some of the steps that are being done here? Steven? Uh, yeah. Here, because of the way rocket proportion happens, mass of the rocket is a function of time. Which means, when you look at the derivation here, I kind of implicitly assumed that the mass is constant. And that's true most of the cases. But if that's not the case, as in I had to say final mass, and initial mass, then this step here doesn't work. And I need this step to relate this directly to acceleration. Otherwise, um, so, so I guess um, what I'm to, trying to say is that Um, I probably shouldn't mess with this. So, so once you say this, then the rest of the steps become questionable. Like, is that no long, you can't do this factorization anymore, which means you can't do this anymore. And now can you say this? 
And uh, let me just tell you this as a matter of you knowing something about physics. This is something that somebody just has to tell you. That the first expression, which is the expression that you are familiar with, that's wrong. Turns out force is not equal to mass times acceleration. Um, so I'm, so this is one of the few lies that I will admit to telling you in this class. So we do start a introduction to force with mass times acceleration, but now I'm telling you that that's not really how you want to define a force because um, it's not gonna be true all the time. It's true most of the time, that's why we started out with it, but this is the case study that tells you that this is wrong. What is correct is the second expression that we are telling you now, that force is equal to rate of change of uh, momentum. And in fact, this is actually the definition of force. So I, I will take this to be the actual definition of force. That force is defined to be rate of change of momentum. So, you know, um, why wouldn't I start out with that um, to start the semester? Why do I drag you through all that path, you know, uh, with all this? Like, why didn't I start out by just telling you on the, not first today, but the first day of the uh, third week, that force is rate of change of momentum? Why didn't I do that? Yeah, we haven't introduced the momentum yet. So I could have told you this from the beginning, but you wouldn't have understood because, well, I had to define momentum. Um, but unless you went through some of the dynamics using this as a crutch, then we wouldn't have concept to, to even describe this. This is one of the senses in which uh, physics is cumulative. That um, this is one of the fundamental definitions of, of that you need to know as you're doing physics in the future. But you know, for you to understand this, you kind of had to be boost, uh, bootstrapped, bootstrapped into knowing something about mass and velocity and sort of seeing the sense for this. So here, uh, what I would say is that we actually bypass all of this. So the actual correct expression here is that this is equal to the applied force times change of time. So, um, so you know, this will be true whenever mass is constant. Whenever mass is not constant, we don't worry about this at all, we just go to this directly. Good. And this expression here, oops, not this one. Uh, this expression here is the one that's actually correct all the time. The second expression, it's often correct, but not always. Yeah. All right, so um, I still haven't told you why momentum is conserved, right? <laughs> so um, 